Um, if you've got your Bible there, we're going to be um, in a couple of places in Scripture. Um, maybe go ahead and find um, 2 Kings chapter 5. Um, good evening. Y'all come right on in. Um, we are up to um, what probably is, um, I would call it the most familiar story from the life of the prophet Elisha uh, that we're going to be in tonight. And what I've done is, because it takes up almost the entire fifth chapter of 2 Kings, um, I've divided it in two. So uh, that way maybe I can get through it. You know, that gives me hope. So, and it also gives you hope that maybe you'll get out on time tonight. So um, she'll help. Yep. <laughs> You know, it, it helps when she's in here because she starts raising the flag back there. So, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you want to be finding that, we're also going to be in a few other places in Scripture. So maybe stick a marker in there in Second Kings chapter 5 because we're going to be around. Also, remember, we always have this up on the screen. So if you don't have to fumble through Scripture, I always think it's good kind of practice, Bible drill practice, just kind of finding stuff in Scripture. But um, please feel free to work through that as yeah it is it is well tonight the screen's basically white in the background so uh it ought to stand out a little bit more for you i hope we can move down closer if y'all want to that'd be fun or turn around and look at that one that's the one i can see and it's big so all right i've really enjoyed this study i'm gonna Every week now, you know, we've tried to do a little bit of a review of some of the background material for Elisha, and I've tried to change. Last week, last week we did a little quiz. The week before that, we did a little an acronym, you know, with his the letters from his name to kind of to kind of give some of this. Um, but I think most of the stuff we've been talking about should be familiar to you by now. Um, working through uh, the life of the prophet Elisha, uh, feel like we're we're kind of beginning to wind down with him so we're kind of getting down close to the end but but i think the study of naaman itself um, is kind of a almost a standalone study uh, the fifth chapter of second kings and, and i think you're going to find this very interesting so tonight what we're going to do is kind of lay the groundwork um, i'm going to read the first 19 verses of that so that's a lengthy passage really for us to try to cover i'm not going to try to get through 19 verses tonight teaching okay Basically, we're going to look at just the first verse tonight, all right, because it's kind of an introduction to the story about Naaman. But there's, boy, there's a lot of applicable, deep Bible truth here for us to kind of dig into that I think um, you'll really appreciate as we, as we kind of get into it. Um, let's, let's review just a little bit. I always feel like it's important for us to go back and kind of remember where we are. Um, and, and I'll do that kind of just by asking some questions and letting you respond tonight rather than you having to fill something in uh, about some of this background material because I've been given to you so much that you know most of it. Uh, I think last week you guys zipped through that quiz and got every one of those right, right off the bat. So um, tonight we'll just kind of talk about some of these things. Um, just kind of as a reminder, remember that um, Elisha... Uh, was a kind of an understudy or, or a, a disciple um, of Elijah, the, the, the prophet um, of Israel prior to him, uh, followed him around, kind of followed in his shadow, um, and so becomes a very significant figure. We studied the life of Elijah and then kind of wanted to piggyback that into the life of Elisha, uh, just because it's not one of those studies we dig into very much. Now, um, remember the contrast that we've been giving just a little bit. Um, Elijah's name meant that Jehovah is God. And he came on the scene ministering in the northern kingdom of the divided kingdom of Israel. And the northern kingdom was called Israel. The southern kingdom was called Judah. And so if you want to put that map up there, they can kind of see it. I can show it to them. Uh, we've been looking at this every week. I know the words are really tiny on there, so it's hard to see, but that's the Mediterranean city, Sea on the, in the blue, and that's Israel, pretty much all up the side of that. So down towards the bottom of your map, um, you'll see uh, right, right across kind of from uh, the, the Sea there of Galilee, you'll see Judah. Uh, do y'all see that? That's the southern kingdom, okay? And then if you'll just kind of go straight up towards the coastline, you'll see Israel. That's the northern kingdom. So by this time, the kingdoms have divided. The southern kingdom is interesting because the kingdom of Judah stayed pretty faithful to Jehovah God and followed him. Uh, now they had some kings that 
you know, came in and were not as, not as good in leading the people towards God. Some of them tried to lead, lead them away. But the southern kingdom stayed in pretty good shape. The northern kingdom drifted from God, drifted into pagan idolatries. Uh, remember that began with Elijah, who was king. Ahab. And remember, Ahab had married, and if you look at the map up there, a woman from Phoenicia, uh, the, the son of the king of Phoenicia, and her name was Jezebel. And that was an alliance that was formed. Well, up in Phoenicia, they worshipped the god Baal. And Jezebel, when she married Ahab, brought Baal worship into the northern kingdom of Israel. And so the northern kingdom of Israel became wicked and corrupt, and Baalism kind of saturated that area. So God raised up prophets, and many of our prophets that you'll read in Scripture are fighting that pagan worship of Baal because God's people have left uh, the worship of God. So when you study the Old Testament, you'll, like not too long ago, I preached from the book of Amos, and Amos came preaching it. God called him in to confront the Baal worship, people who began to worship uh, the pagan god Baal and had left to God. And you'll see many other prophets like that. Well, that was Elijah's call. And remember his name meant Jehovah is God. And we said that kind of characterized his ministry through the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, he came proclaiming that Jehovah's God, not Baal, and calling God's people back to the worship of Jehovah God. And there were some very um, high points in Elijah's ministry that said Jehovah's God. For example, Mount Carmel. There was a competition, remember, between the gods of the God of Baal and, and, and Jehovah God. And Elijah said, whichever God answers the sacrifice, he is the true God. And remember that God answered by fire a wet, saturated, soaked sacrifice on Mount Carmel. The fire fell and consumed it, but the prophets of Baal couldn't produce that. And so many of the prophets of Baal were killed and wiped out during that time. And so Elijah was used to, to call the people back to Jehovah God. Jehovah is God. But his understudy was Elisha. Okay. Now, what, what does Elisha's name mean? God is salvation. So, so these names become significant. And you're going to see that tonight in the study of Nahum. Uh, uh, Naaman, I think you're going to find this very interesting, uh, the meaning of his name and some of those things. Those names become very significant because it almost becomes um, a picture of, of who they are, how God used them, the message that God would have through them. So uh, Elisha followed Elijah when Elijah, remember, was uh, taken from the earth by the whirlwind and carried to heaven. He's one of the only two men in scripture that did not die, right? carried to heaven, then the mantle of his ministry fell to Elisha. Elisha picked up the mantle and began to serve. And we've been following him backtrack through the same kind of places in the footsteps of where Elijah had been. And he's going back. And now the message has changed. He is the prophet of miracles. And every one of those miracles are pro proclaiming that God is salvation, that salvation is found in God. So he's Elijah said, Jehovah is God. And now Elisha is saying, Jehovah saves. God, God is salvation. He will save you because the land has become famine ridden because of the, their Baal worship. Uh, the land has become very pagan, uh, very culturally corrupt. Remember in this study, we've talked a lot about the commonalities between the day we're living in and what they were facing in that day. And so now Elisha is offering the hope of Jehovah God. The story we're going to be looking at tonight um, is no different than that. So uh, I want to jump right into that and kind of talk about it a little bit. Um, so the map's up there. So let me kind of kind of point some of this out, out to you um, tonight. We've been pretty much centering with uh, um, Elisha in the northern kingdom of Israel and right there down around the very top of the Sea of Galilee, if you see that, uh, where Bethel, Gilgal, and Jericho are, uh, maybe you can see that uh, there. That's where we've been centering, and that's where we left him at Gilgal last week. Um, remember where he um, multiplied the bread for the starving prophets, remember? Um, and that's where we left him last week at the end of chapter 4. That's where he is. Well, now um, something else has happened. Sarah, can you put that map back where it's small again so I can show them this? Up at the very top, um, over towards the right, it would be my right-hand corner, um, I think that is what it would be for you too. You see at the very top, Damascus and Aram, that's Syria. 
So your Bible tonight may say Syria and it, or it may say Aram. We're going to be centering around that area. A message has come from the king of Aram who were um, enemies of Israel. Often they were fighting, often attacking, much like Phoenicia was and Moab and Ammon and some of those other areas around Israel were always attacking them. And Aram was like that. Um, But the king has sent a message to the king of Israel who is corrupt. Okay, he's corrupt. And he has sent a message to him. We're going to see that in tonight's story. And it's going to be very significant kind of as we look at this message through the prophet Elisha that that God is salvation. Now, I want you to think about this as we're getting into this tonight. Um, And we're going to see this over and over again tonight as we study it. Um, God is salvation to who? That's right, everyone. Most of Elisha's ministry has centered around where? The northern kingdom of Israel, okay? Um, and, and so God's people, that's who the message has been going to. But all of a sudden in tonight's story, the message is going to change. It's going to leave Israel and the message is going to begin, begin to affect the people of Aram or Syria up there the hope of salvation through Jesus Christ. That's going to be very, very significant. uh, And we're going to see this tonight. I love this story. Um, I like to preach this story. I think this story is so filled with rich, rich stuff. That's why I've divided this lesson um, into two. And I want us to look at it tonight. So if you're there in your Bible, go to 2 Kings chapter 5. I'm going to read the first 19 verses um, of that chapter um, so that you can kind of see what's going on here. I think this story is, this whole chapter is just packed with meat. Um, And we'll get into some of that tonight, lay the groundwork, um, even for next week's study um, as we're moving through it. So um, take a look at it, beginning in verse one of chapter five. I'm going to read it. It'll be on the screen. You follow along with me um, as I read here. Uh, Jump right into it there. Now, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, And if you have a different translation, it may say Aram. Some of you have Aram in your Bible there. Same place, okay? Uh, Now, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of the master. Because by him, and this is very significant, because by him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. Now, think about that statement right there just for a second. Who's God's chosen people? Israel. God's chosen people are in Israel and Judah. It's a divided kingdom now. All right. But isn't this interesting that God is involved in the affairs of other nations? Do you see that? All right. That's amazing to me because it says he's, he's been blessed. He's honorable men in the eyes of the master because by him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. So Naaman was also a mighty man of valor. But here's the problem but a leper. You see that? Verse two, and the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back a captive, a young girl from the land of Israel. And she waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, um, we'll go back to that and I'll show you where that is. That's, that was the main headquarters for Elisha was Samaria, okay? Um, which, by the way, was the capital of Israel. We think of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, but Samaria was the capital at this time because Jerusalem was the capital of Judah, okay? All right, so in Samaria, for, uh, verse 3, Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. The king of Israel, who is not worshiping Jehovah God at this time. He's he's devoted to, to Baal. He's you know, okay, so, so go and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and he took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold and 10 changes of clothing. And then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, now be advised when this letter comes to you, 
that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive, that this man sends a man to me to heal him of this leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how, we seek, how he seeks a quarrel with me. So he thinks it's a trap. You know, I, I, can't heal, I can't heal him. And besides that, where is his faith? Where's the faith of the king of Israel at this time? It's divided at best, okay? It's weak. So verse eight, so it was when Elisha, the man of God heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariots and he stood at the door of Elisha's house and Elijah sent a messenger, a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy are not the Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and he went away in a rage. Now let me just stop there for a minute and make a note. God had a plan for Naaman's healing, but Naaman wanted a show. He, he wanted him to come out and wave his hand over him. He, he wanted all the pomp and the circumstance. He wanted to be treated like I'm somebody special. He wanted all of that. And he went off in a rage because he didn't get the show he wanted. That's interesting. How many times do we miss the hand of God in our life because we're not willing to humble ourselves before him when he speaks? Now just think about that. God speaks sometimes in simple ways, in still small voices, but we want the sensational. We want the show. We don't want to be humbled. And he was calling, him, calling here to humble himself. This is a man of honor from Aram, from Syria, who he's saying, now come and humble yourselves before the God of Israel and, and bathe in our river. You, you see that? Um, just think how many times we miss God because we won't humble, humble ourselves under himself, under him. So remember that scripture that says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will do what? Anybody know? Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. He will raise you up, okay? Uh, that's in one of the minor prophets, okay? Uh, uh, Zechariah, okay? All right, so look at verse 13. So a servant came near and spoke to Naaman and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more than when he says to you, wash and be cleansed? So essentially the servant humbled him, <laughs> kind of put him in his place. Verse 14, so he went down and he dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all of his aides, and came and stood before him and said, Indeed now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So Naaman said, then if not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offerings or sacrifices to other gods, but to the Lord. Yet in this thing, may the Lord pardon your servant when my master goes into the temple of Rimon to worship there. And he leans on my hand and I bow in that temple of Rimon. When I bow down in the temple of Rimon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. And then he said, go in peace. So he departed from him a short distance. 
So I'm going to stop there. Um, and next week, we'll probably look at the bulk of that passage of Scripture. Um, but tonight, we just want to kind of begin to develop it a little bit and think about what's going on in this passage of Scripture. Th- this has been a passage of Scripture that many biblical scholars point to as a passage that points to the salvation that would come through, Messiah, through the Messiah. Uh, that, 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 it's, that Remember, Elisha's life often is, is picturing foreshadowing the coming Messiah. The last two miracles were miracles of Jesus that he would later perform. And so this particular miracle is very interesting too because Jesus was known to heal lepers just like God used Elisha in this situation. So the story of Elisha, remember, as the miracle prophet um, proclaiming that God is salvation is pointing to Jesus. And Naaman is the centerpiece of, in Elijah's ministry, that's proclaiming that salvation, listen, is for everyone, for all who will humble themselves and come, okay? And that's a very, very powerful message we're going to get out of this as we work through. Now, in these verses, there's an anticipation of the gospel that would go out from Israel through the Messiah and then out from the church, carrying the light of Jesus Christ to the entire world. Naaman's healing was an illustration of what God would later do in the ministry of Jesus himself through his church. And so we can't miss this one. Now think about what was Jesus's ministry that he even today wants to carry out through the church. Why did Jesus come? What was his ministry? What did he say about himself? I came to seek and save that which was lost. Okay. And the verse that we love to quote says, who was, who was that for? Who did he come to seek and save that's lost? The whole world, right? So, so, so think about that a little bit. And that's a picture that we see here. This is a picture of, of, of God's salvation coming to a man from Syria, a pagan, worshiper of Rimon, another pagan god beside Baal, okay? And you can study Rimon himself, that wicked, wicked. All right, so it's amazing to me the work that, that God is already doing in the life of, of Naaman. Here's something that I want to just kind of ping on here for a second before we kind of move on. You and I often are so terrified of the calling on our life to be soul winners. We're going to talk a lot about that in the next two weeks, about sharing our faith. You read statistics today, and they'll say things like, uh, like less than uh, 99% of Christians Less than 99% of Christians have never led anybody to Jesus in their lifetime. So most Christians never, never share their faith. They never reach anybody for Christ. And yet that's our calling. And so, so you think about this. Why are we so afraid to share our faith, do you think? Why do so many people um, shy back or pull back from being soul winners or, or evangelistic or being a witness for Christ or, or telling others about Jesus or sharing? If 99% of Christians never tell anybody about Jesus, really, never share their faith, why don't, why don't we? I'm sorry? Rejected. Afraid of, re- of being rejected, yeah. certainly. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Maybe ridicule or and rejection or, okay. You're, you're a fanatic. Okay. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Why, why else? Don't we share our faith? <coughs> okay. We don't feel like we know enough, right? Like, I, I don't know enough to share my faith. I don't, I don't feel educated enough really about what to share or what. Okay. What else? Anybody? Okay. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. We feel like the pressure's on us to save someone and we, we, we can't. Sometimes we have things in our own life. We're like, who am I to tell somebody else how to live their life when I myself am struggling so much with all of this, right? So you can think of a, a number of reasons that we may, and maybe in your own life, you've had some of those reasons before. Naaman's story is very encouraging for us in this call that's on our life, because one of the things that emerges from Naaman's story all the way back in verse one is that it's God that prepares the harvest field, not you. 
God prepares men's hearts to receive him. It's interesting in verse 1, if you go back and look at your passage of Scripture there, that it says, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. God was already at work up in that foreign land, Syria, that worships a pagan god, Rimon, and the Lord's name is mentioned in the midst of that. And listen, God's already begun to prepare the heart for Naaman to receive the gospel. That's something you need to remember. That if God begins to prompt you to share, don't let the enemy scare you out of sharing. Because if God prompts you to share, he's been there before you. He's already begun to prepare that heart. And, and sometimes it's just a conversation you're going to have with them and you're going to find that God's, God's already begun to cultivate the soil of that heart for you to share with them. And, and the truth of the matter is, listen, if you know him and if you've experienced him, um, you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to know exactly all the scripture. You just tell about what God's done in your life and let the Holy Spirit do the worst, the rest. You just tell who he is to you, the difference he's made in your life, and you let the Holy Spirit, because it's his work, not yours, okay? So those become some very powerful things. Now, I want to think about this just a little bit. Think of what God has called us to, all right? And hold your place there. Put something in 2 Kings chapter 5. And let's, let's flip over in our Bibles to the New Testament. Go all the way to the end of Matthew. This will be a very, very familiar passage of Scripture to you. But I want you to hear it. And I want you to think about this. Um, Matthew chapter 28 Right there at the very end, verses 18 through 20. Um, interestingly, this is one of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances. Um, he's already died on the cross, been in the tomb, raised from the, from the dead. And remember, he lived, he, he lived again on earth after his resurrection for about 40 days and was seen and witnessed by many people, saw him. And, and this is one of those post-resurrection appearances where he made this statement. And I want you to listen close to it in Matthew chapter um, 28 there, beginning in verse 18 through 20. Listen to this. All right, here's what Jesus, that, what God has called us to. Jesus told his disciples this. He said, and Jesus Christ came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. All right. Now, what's that called? That's the Great Commission, right? A uh, bunch, of, bunch of good little Baptists here. You'll know exactly how to answer that one. We all know what the Great Commission is, right? But well, who is supposed to do this? Okay, every Christian. So when you read this passage of scripture, who is he talking to? His disciples, his followers. And Jesus noticed this passage. Now look at it very closely. It says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. All right. Jesus has the authority now as, as the master of life and death. He's conquered the grave. He's given his life for us on the cross. All authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. For what? Yeah. For our salvation, for our sin, for the gospel story, okay? All authorities, everything's been done is what he's saying. Like the salvation's complete. He's, he's, done everything necessary in order that man might be made right with God. And now what are we supposed to do? Go and tell. You see that? We're supposed to go and tell. Now, just, just think about that. Now, who is this for? Like, who are we to go and tell? Notice it in this passage of scripture. Everyone. Who's excluded? Now think that through. Who's excluded? Are the people you don't like excluded? Are the countries that we have a problem with excluded? Because we got a problem with some countries right now. Y'all mentioned some of them all ago. The stuff going on in our world. Are the communist countries excluded? Well, Syria wasn't included. That worshiped the pagan god Rimon. God was already at work there, right? What about the terrorist countries? Iran, Iraq. Afghanistan, those places that we're scared to death of, are they excluded? 
They're not. We need to understand that as the church, as, as the people of God. That's, that's who we're supposed to be sending folks to, to be witnesses um, in this world. So that's three powerful. Now here's another one. Kind of just go over a little bit further and go to Acts chapter 1. One more before, I know guys, this is just part one of this study, okay? So don't panic. Acts 1.8. Another post-resurrection experience of Jesus. And this one's right before, at the very end of the 40 days that he was here on earth, he's just about to ascend back to heaven. And in Acts 1.8, he's speaking to his disciples. And he says to them, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world. Okay, wh- wh- what did Jesus just say to his disciples? What did he say that they're to be? What did he tell them? What's their, what's, what are they called? Witnesses. Y- you know, we're called a lot of things as Christians. I don't know how you would identify. Um, and, and we've got a whole cult group that has hijacked that name. So very rarely do we want to call ourselves witnesses or we're going to get lumped in with who? Yeah. But you know who the true Jehovah's Witnesses are, right? The church of Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to. We are called to proclaim this message, all right, that Jehovah saves. Now, what does Elisha's name mean? That Jehovah saves that he is salvation, all right? And that's what we're called to. We're called to be witnesses for him. And who are we to witness to according to that? It's almost like he draws these concentric circles. We're to witness right here where we are in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then where? To the ends of the earth, he said, all right? At that time, I venture to say they may not even know where the ends of the earth were right? But he said everywhere. Now, again, the story of Naaman's healing in 2 Kings 5 is an illustration of what God would later do in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ himself and his church. Namely, that we kind of as believers recognize that he desires the salvation of all men for for all men to come to him, uh, to be witnesses. And, And so Naaman's story kind of hinges on that. We kind of begin to see that a little bit. Now, tonight, we're just kind of kind of introduce Naaman a little bit. I want us to get to know him because next we're going to see how Naaman's story is foreshadowing, picturing Jesus and what he desires of us as believers in the church to be doing. All right. So we're just going to kind of talk about Naaman here. We're going to focus this evening, really, if you want to go back to um, our passage in 2 Kings 5, just in that first verse, because the first verse kind of introduces Naaman to us and tells us who this man is. And I want us to see that. So look at verse one of the, one again and kind of look at this. So it says this, now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. Because by him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. So verse one tells us pretty much everything we need to know about Naaman. And this becomes very picture. Now, now, now Naaman um, really is a picture of us. He's a picture of, of us, of, of who we are. He's, he is um, almost every man, okay? Um, he, he's a picture of who we are. Um, your Bible may call the name of the country again, Aram, but again, that's, that's Syria. So Naaman's name, listen, is very interesting because here he is from Syria and Aram, which was a pagan country to Israel. And yet his name was a Hebrew name. That's interesting. And, and his name is spelled N-A-E-M. Switch two letters and letters a couple places and you got what name? The name name, right? Do you see that? Uh, that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, so, so think about this. What's in a name, really? We, we've been talking about names all through this. We've talked about Elijah's name, which means Jehovah is God. And we've talked about... I um, uh, cannot spit it out. I want to say Elijah every time. Elijah's name, which means what? 
God is salvation. And names in the Bible become very interesting. Well, it's very interesting to me that Naaman's name comes from the Greek word N-A-E-M. Naim. Okay? Um, and, and think about um, what, what a name is, really. What, how do you choose a name for your, your, your child? How, how, how did you choose names for your children? Like, how did you pick those names? Have you, have you ever noticed nobody ever names their child Judas? <laughs> right? And when you teach school, you Oh, we have fun sometimes. Nancy comes home and tells me some of her kids' names, and I'm like, like, yeah. And in some regions where we've been, it's a little bit more ridiculous than other areas, but <laughs> kind of interesting sometimes. But think about that just a little bit. Literally, this Hebrew word that if you just switch a few letters means the name name, it literally means um, delightful, pleasant, or beautiful. Remember that when God created man and when God created um, everything that exists, uh, about everything that exists, he said it's good. But when he created man, what did he say? Very good. Okay, it's it's delightful. It's, it's beautiful. It's pleasant. And, and what made it so delightful, pleasant, beautiful? What made it so very good? What was different about man, all right, and the rest of creation? That's right. The image of God. We're made in the image of God. So there is a special love that God has for you. And, and I'm going to say this because sometimes we need to hear this and understand this. Some days we don't feel like this, but you need to know that God delights in you. He does. He delights in you. Naaman, from another country that worshiped a pagan God, all right, and he even acknowledges it in the end of that story. I don't know if you noticed it, but he used to worship that pagan God. And now he says, I know that there's no God in all the earth except Jehovah God, but please forgive me when I'm assisting my master and we enter his temple to his pagan God and he bows and I have to bow with him. Forgive me for that because I'm not worshiping him anymore. But think about how God delights in Naaman. He had delighted in Naaman. And we would call Naaman a lost pagan heathen right? And there's some people we think about today that we watch on TV or we listen to and go, well, they're nothing but a lost pagan heathen. And God delights in them. He loves them. I've said this before. You will never meet anybody that Jesus didn't die on the cross for. And why? Because he loves them and he delights in them. And that's a very powerful picture in Naaman's name that we must not, be, not, must not miss. Now, because of the significance of names in Scripture, this tells us something about this man. Um, there's something about him. And verse 1 kind of begins to tell us about it. His name suggests that he was an undoubtedly, possibly, according to most of the kind of biblical commentaries I looked up in preparing this, he, he likely was a pretty handsome man, okay? At, at least before leprosy hit him. All right. We'll talk about leprosy here in a minute. The most of the studies about it, but it can mess up a handsome man. I'll tell you. All right. Further, the implication is that he was also great, a gracious man, delightful. Uh, people liked him, but but his name um, became a reproach and a striking contrast to the appearance, and probably also to his disposition because of a disease that attacked his body. All right, so in verse one, you begin to get all of that. His name provides a striking picture of mankind created physically and spiritually beautiful in the image of God before sin took its toll. So what you're seeing in every man here, right, is that we belong to him, we're created in his image, and he delights in us, and we are beautiful in his sight, but we are marred by leprosy, sin. You see it? That's why this story is so central to Elisha's ministry, because Elisha's name means God is salvation. And he's going to tell us in Naaman's story what that looks like when he saves. 
And it becomes such a powerful picture that he's giving us in Scripture. And I think sometimes, listen, we read these Old Testament stories like these beautiful narratives. And I love the historical narrative of the Old Testament. But there's something in God's Word that he is teaching us about himself and about us and about his love for us and his mission for us as believers. And we must not miss that. I think this is so powerful. So and in this way, Naaman is first... To, is first described kind of with this picture and, and he's seen by people who, who tend to most likely kind of favor maybe an outward appearance. But, but God kind of centers on something here and says, he's not unlike you. Now, in verse one there, there's four things that we learn about Naaman. And I want you just to jot these down. Let's work through it so you get it here on your page. I think this is something you've got there to fill in. So uh, make note of this. First, he tells us about his position. He tells us that he was a commander or a captain of the army of the kings of Syria or Aram. That means that he was probably second in command. The only person higher than him was probably the king himself. And you go, well, where are you getting that? Well, if you read the entire story, you, he even says, the king trusts in no one like he trusts in me. He, he's probably the second in command. When the king goes to worship, who does he depend on to take him? Who does he lean on? His second in command. And so probably the, the second highest ranking official um, in Syria at this time was probably Naaman. Okay, that's, that's pretty significant when you look at this. Um, he was considered a great man of authority and position. He was a man of power. Uh, he commanded a lot of respect and weight because of his high esteemed position. Okay, and then second... This verse tells us something about his popularity and his prestige, okay? It's noted in the words that he was a great and honorable or respected man in the eyes of his master. Here was this popular man, a national hero perhaps in some ways. Maybe he had led the armies of Syria, Aram, in many victories. We're kind of told that in the first chapter. Um, maybe with him, he was a national hero. He, he was someone that everyone looked up to. And by that, it's not surprising that God was already beginning to do a work in his life. And what was that work? It's leprosy. We don't see pain and suffering the same way that God does. I'm just telling you that. That God's often up to something, Okay. So don't miss that. All right. Now here's his problem. It tells us all those good things, but look what it says. And this is very interesting right there at the very end of verse one um, in our passage of scripture. Look what it says. It says all these accolades, all these things about his position and his power and his prestige and his popularity, and he's well loved and he's well respected. But how does verse one end? But he was a leper. All right. He's got all this going for him, all of his ducks in a row, right? Life is good. He's got lots of friends. He's got fame. He's got fortune, but he's got a problem. And here's what I'm going to tell you, that we all have a problem. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I don't care who you are, what you think you have going for you, how good life is for you. You know, you may think I've got, I've got it all together. I go to church regularly. I do this, I do this, I do this. But here's the problem. We are all marred by sin, all of us, okay? So, so the problem here is that he was a leper, all right? Um, now, what did I tell you last week about when you look at your Bible and you see italicized words? What is that telling you? Anybody remember? I gave you a little, a little Bible lesson last time. What does that mean? Yeah, it's, it's not in the original text. It's not in the original Hebrew, all right? So if you look at your Bible there, you'll see some words that are italicized. So I want you to think about how this would probably read mostly. Um, look, look at that verse and let me read it the way that it would probably read if you take out the italicized words there. Now, Naaman commander of the army of the king of Israel was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, a leper. That's what it says. Isn't that interesting? 
That's how the Hebrew would read, all right? Because where, it said, where your Bible may say in italics there, he was a leper, but he was a leper. That's not in the original language. It's just leper tacked on the end. It's interesting because that's what your monogram is too. Because of sin, because of the fall in the garden, all right? Like, I mean, I look at you and I go, beautiful, talented, right? Very gifted with what they do, uh, very popular with people. They have a powerful job. They've got a great family. They come from good stock, right? You see all those things that we say, but a leper. They're lost. They need Jesus. They need salvation. That's what it's telling you. That Naaman had everything the world had to offer, but that word, lost. A leper. You see it? That's very powerful. That's, that's his problem. Now, let me kind of think about this. You know, leprosy is a life-threatening infection. It's mentioned over 45 times in the Bible. Leprosy was, was used all throughout Scripture as this kind of picture of, of sin. They're always compared in Scripture. You'll see it over and over. Let me give you four similarities here between leprosy and sin. This is, this is very interesting. We'll dig some more into this, kind of been talking about this one. All right? Is, I got a little bit of time left, don't I? Not much. What'd you say? Okay. I just got to get in better shape, right, Nancy, that I could get through this. <laughs> no, I'm not threatened by that at all. It's the truth. All right, four similarities here between leprosy and sin. Think about this, okay? All right, number one, sin numbs us to our condition. Sin numbs us to our condition. Um, I'm going to tell this story because Trey's getting ordained on Sunday and I love this story. When Trey was a little boy, I was pastoring at Allen, Oklahoma, and he came tottering up the aisle. Yeah, yeah. One Sunday morning during invitation and he went to our student minister at the time. Brad Clay was his name, but he went to him and so he told Brad he wanted to be saved, which I love that. I love that. You know, we've always, with our kids, had tried to be really open with them to do that. And, and so Brad began to go through the meal, you know, that you normally would, you know. And so he began with the Roman road and kind of talked about sin and all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And he said, Trey, you know you're a sinner. And Trey said, I'm not a sinner. <laughs> he said, you don't think you sin? And he said, no, I don't sin. You know, my mom and dad would whip me if I sinned. <laughs> I'm not a sinner. And Brad said, go sit down. Go back to your chair and sit down. All right. You know, sometimes the last person to recognize that they're a sinner is a sinner. And it's true because sin numbs us to our condition, just like leprosy does. If you study the disease of leprosy, it causes your appendages to go numb where you can no, no longer feel them. If you've kind of ever seen any of those biblical movies, you'll hear them talking about how their ears and their nose falls off and their finger digits fall off, all that kind of stuff. It just sounds horrible, doesn't it? But that's what leprosy does, right? It causes you to be numb. Uh, so, so that's kind of what sin is like. So that's a similarity that you'll hear. Second is sin leads to death. And leprosy is like that too. Leprosy is a progression uh, the lack of sensation leads to fatal tissue and limb damage. And think about what sin does. It causes people to make bad decisions, often leading to more bad decisions and disaster from them. Okay? And that's true. And then here's another similarity. Um, we can't hide sin. We think we can. But be careful. Your sin will find you out, right? Um, we can't really hide our sin. And we, we may be... <laughs> We may be able to hide it a long time to other people, but you can't hide it from God, right? He knows we're marred by sin. Um, people with leprosy can't hide their disease. Um, likewise, the action of people trapped in sin eventually becomes obvious. And then the fourth one there is that sin produces outcasts. Lepers were driven from their homes and made to live outside the city um, like lepers. Afflictions like um, drugs, I mean, I mean like um, sins that we get caught up in can turn us into outcasts in a way. 
Um, so we, we begin to despise ourselves for the things that we do that we can't get over. So remember in Scripture that leprosy is a portrait of sin and man's true spiritual condition and our need for a Savior, for God's salvation, because nothing can save us from that. If it could have, Naaman would have already found it. Right? And then the fourth thing there is the principle. Okay, The principle that we need to see is that Many today are perishing from the loathsome leprosy of sin. One may be great and successful and wealthy and honorable and mighty, but spiritually a leper lost. To realize one's lost condition before God and to desire to escape from it are the last steps toward salvation. Naaman discovered this. It's very interesting the path that you follow with Naaman through this. Because here's what happens. A woman, a servant girl in the home of Naaman, who was a Jehovah God worshiper, right? Knew of the hope of God and shared that with her master, which was Naaman's wife. She shared it with Naaman. Naaman shared it with the king of Aram and Aram sent him on a path to the man of God, okay? Um, who could tell him the truth about this. And it's a very interesting path. It's almost like the journey that we take to find Christ in our own life, to reach him. We need to know that God delights in us and that he will lead us on the the greatest adventure of our life to come into saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, to get to know him. And that's a powerful truth that you kind of learn from his life. Now, let's think some more here about leprosy for a second. I'm going to give you some details here because we're going to hear a whole lot about this um, next week when we kind of move into part two of the story of Naaman. And I just want you to see this. Now, the biblical instructions for leprosy, um, the separation, isolation, cleansing of the leper, and thus the biblical foundation for a picture of sin are really described throughout scripture. It's interesting. um, We don't have a lot in scripture about diseases from that day, but all through scripture, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, there are tons of passages that deal with one thing, leprosy, okay? It's the one disease of biblical times, whether it's Old or New Testament, that we have more about than anything else. Why do you think that is? Why is that the disease that we find out about most in Scripture that's kind of referenced all throughout Scripture. Yes, exactly. Because it's an interesting analogy, right, of our condition of sin in our life. Um, I wonder sometimes if today, um, and I don't mean any disrespect in saying this, if, if maybe the, the catch word wouldn't be leprosy, but maybe cancer, if it was written today if you would see a lot of kind of common analogies from cancer and sin, because often if you think about cancer, it's a lot like sin, isn't it? Um, deep inside, we don't know we've got it till. Yeah, that's true. It, sometimes, I mean, we're going to kind of find out what it was. So in scripture, kind of beginning as far back in Leviticus, there's two whole chapters in Leviticus, chapter 13 and 14, that deal with the subject of leprosy. Um, and this is very interesting that was pointed out in the study. You go back and, and I, I thought, okay, th- this would lead us down a whole nother path and it would take us forever uh, to get through this. So I just kind of went and did the study myself. So kind of come back and give you some highlights from it. So when you study um, Leviticus chapters 13 and 14, it's all the, all the laws for Israel concerning leprosy. And it's interesting, 22 times in that passage of scripture, Here's what was to happen. The priest was to examine it. The priest was to diagnose it. 22 times it actually uses the phrase. Well, now think of this. Um, Those priests all died. But we have a great high priest who can address the subject of sin in our life and can make us white as snow, right? Right? can wash us and cleanse us and purge us. He's the great high priest. And that's interesting because the law really, remember, is pointing to Christ, all right? Elisha, we got here, pointing to Christ. Naaman's story is pointing to Christ and our need for him, okay? So that's very interesting, all right? So here it is. The Hebrew word for, les- for, for leprosy is, I'm gonna spell it for you, 
T-Z-A-R-A-A-T. T-Z-A-R-A-A-T. Zerot. Uh-huh. Zerot. It, it's, it's actually a, word, a, Greek, a Hebrew word that's translated as skin diseases. Okay? And, and this is kind of interesting. Um, when we hear leprosy today, we think of Hansen's disease. What today is called Hansen's disease. And, and that's kind of our connotation of leprosy. But in biblical times, that phrase was used in a more generic way. Um, it was used to talk, all, all the skin diseases were lumped together. Now, we're going to talk about this here in a minute. I'm going to give you the two types of, of, of leprosy. Um, you know, we're dealing with this thing right now, this pandemic. Some people have COVID. Some people just have a bad cough. Like for me, I've been here for the last few weeks exposing you to whatever I have, which is nothing, right? Because they keep testing me for stuff. I have nothing but this horrible cough and the sinuses and allergies, all that kind of stuff. But we never know. But we lump it all together. We say, boy, everybody's got the COVID. No, they don't. Here's the difference, all right? Skin, some skin diseases went away in a few days and they were declared cl clean by the priest. Some skin diseases were like psoriasis, right? Not contagious. But what we identify as true leprosy was extremely contagious. And when a person was diagnosed with true leprosy, they were ostracized from community, okay? So basically in scripture, there's two types of leprosy. Um, there's one that's called um, lepromatous, lepromatous uh, type. Um, this is the dangerous type that they feared the most in scripture because it would take out whole communities. Um, as this form began to spread, it had terrible results. Um, they'd have swelling in their face, uh, disfigurements in their body. The disease was systemic. It involved the internal organs as well. You couldn't see what was going on in the inside. You could just see what was going on on the outside. This is probably what we think most of when we think of leprosy in the Bible. A person that's disfigured, that's very sick, it kind of shows on them, and it's incurable, okay? And they would eventually die from it. Um, that's, that's the first part there, okay? The second type is called the tuberculoid, the tuberculoid type of leprosy from that day. This form is less severe. It begins a lot like the other, so you can't tell at first, um, but it kind of causes skin color changes. But it's usually limited within about a matter of months to a year, it would go away. All right, so that's why they had all these laws about determining when a person was clean or unclean by this. So you know, just tell you all of that to kind of understand that it's a complicated thing in scripture. But when we kind of picture leprosy, we're talking about that first one, the one that's more severe. That's the one that kind of hits to and kind of points to what we describe as um, leprosy today and, and kind of the comparison to sin. All right. Now I'm going to give this to you really quickly. and I'm going to move through these fast. I'm not going to get to talk about them, but I've got 11 statements of significance concerning leprosy in the Bible. All right. I'm just going to rush through them really quick, all right, to get through it so you can get them. All right, here's number one. She's going to put them up there as I go. A leper was considered unclean and had to be isolated from society to a certain degree. All right? So unclean, isolated from society. Second, whenever the Lord Jesus healed a leper, he always pronounced the person not healed, but cleansed. Go back and look. That's interesting. And it's interesting in our story, you're going to see, I'm not supposed to be commenting on these, but I can't help it, guys. You got it. It's interesting in our passage of scripture, right? What does Elisha tell him he has to go do? Go wash and get cleansed, all right? Third, true leprosy was incurable by man. That's that first type we talked about. It was incurable, remember, in Bible times, just as sin is incurable for man. We can't cure it. We try all the time to cure our sin problem. We think if I'm religious, if I go to church, if I do all these things, I can cure my sin problem. It's not curable by man. All right. Third, fourth, 
The rite of purification in the Old Testament did not cure. It only recognized the fact a leper was cured and he was clean of the disease or that he never really had the incurable type of leprosy. All right, the rites of purification in the Old Testament did not cure. They just recognized. Fourth, leprosy, like sin, begins within and then erupts on the outside of the skin. That's interesting. Where is sin born, did Jesus say? In the heart, within, and then comes out. Six, the priest was to examine the skin and pronounce the person clean or unclean, depending upon his observation of the facts. Who knows our heart? Only God. Verse seven, the pain of leprosy, at least in certain forms, was not acute because it also killed the nerves in the affected area, but it kept the victim restless, miserable, frustrated as they felt the stigma of the disease. All right. So, so that's kind of interesting. Think about what sin does to us. It desensitizes us. Remember how Paul talked about our consciences would become seared because of sin. Okay. Verse eight, I mean, number eight, because of the nature of the disease, the leper was often considered as dead. All right. Dead because of the leprosy that is, um, was a kind of living death, although physically alive, kind of pointing to their isolation. Number nine, regardless of one's position, honor, power, possessions, wealth, think Naaman, leprosy like sin is no respecter of persons. Number 10, as previously, as seen previously in Israel, according to the law, lepers were excluded from society as a picture of sin and its effects. And number 11, the leprosy of sin destroys the pleasantness and beauty, thank Naaman's name, that God meant for mankind in his creation. What messed up the game for us? Sin, entering the world, all right? the fall in the garden. All right, takeaways, let me give these to you really quick and then I'm gonna close, all right? Here's the takeaways from this tonight and then next week we'll do part two here. God uses many avenues to bring us to the end of ourselves and to show us our need for him. Can you see that in Naaman's story? Just in what we read tonight and the little bit we've covered, there's a great contrast in verse one, right? Because you get all this picture of all that Naaman had but he had to come to an end of himself to see his need, all right? And that's what God does in our life too, all right? That's very powerful. Boy, I got so much more there I could develop for you and tell you, but I don't have time. Number two, God desires for us to come to recognize the deeper problem in our life and his salvation. God desires for us to come to recognize the deeper problem in our life and his solution, the deeper problem in Naaman's life was not his leprosy, all right? He discovered what the deeper problem was when he went to the water and was, um, went to the prophet and was insulted. What was the deeper problem? I mean, God loved him, delighted in him. He was beautiful to God, right? Marred by sin, but remember what he almost missed. He found the deeper problem and he even acknowledged what his problem was and what his solution was once he trusted God. And he said, there is no God in all the earth like God. And here's number three. God wants us to know that he alone is our hope and salvation. All right, close there. This was supposed to be short tonight, guys. Three point, two point, devotional. Y'all call it what you want to call it. It's all the same to me. Remember, I always dump the whole load. I've told y'all that before. Let me pray for us and we'll be dismissed. Thank you guys for coming tonight. I, I love this study. I love this study of Elisha in the Old Testament. I think, you know, this particular study that we're doing right now pulls out to me so much meat uh, from this great narrative because I've read the story of Naaman so many times. I, I love that story, but boy, this is rich one, so... Let me pray for us and we'll go this evening. Father, thank you for this time in your word tonight. Thank you for each person that's here. 
uh, those who are getting to listen on our live stream tonight, uh, the time that we get to spend together in your word. And God, I know that we're barely scratching the surface of what you want us to see. Lord, tonight, thank you for the affirmation, the reminder that you delight in us, that you sent your only son, Jesus, to die on a cross for us because of your love for us, because of our need. God, help us to see our need and to be willing to humble ourselves before you and come and dip. God, help us, Lord, not to miss that, to rejoice in that and to worship you in that. And even as we leave this place tonight, may we leave here, Father, excited about what you've done in our life, revived in that, and God, ready to tell others about the hope that's in Jesus, to point them to that. Father, we love you. We praise you. We worship you. Pray, God, that you would continue to use us this week as your hands and feet. Bring us back together on Sunday, ready and eager to worship you. It's in your name we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for coming tonight.